Okay, well, my name's Kenneth Wingeter. If you haven't heard of me before, I work for Hydrospace LLC. We produce uh, aquarium bacteria. Uh, I'm based up in uh, Johnstown. And for anyone watching online, uh, we're at Inside Reef in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, this is a presentation about purple non sulfur bacteria, which is primarily what we raise. Uh, I actually asked Ray what we wanted to, what we might want to do this about, and I gave him the option to either do it as an overview of these bacteria or uh, something more specific, like how they're used as food. And to my surprise and to my pleasure, he actually suggested the latter. Usually people just want to keep doing the same overview. So this is actually going to be fun for me because I technically don't get to go into this much depth. And also, uh, this is actually, in my opinion, the most important use of these bacteria uh, by a long shot. So they do a lot of things uh, for the aquarium, a lot of benefits, but the main one is going to be uh, nutrition. So... Uh, unless anyone has any questions to start, and that would be totally fine. Not <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, I will get into that a little bit, um, how I discovered what they are, just where I found them in the first place. Uh, I have a long history of work in uh, microfeed production for aquaculture, and I hadn't even heard of them. Uh, so in researching uh, different phytoplankton, I, I discovered these guys. So they're photosynthetic bacteria, just to start out with. They behave a lot like phytoplankton. Um, but that's kind of how we discovered them. And it was going to be a secret in-house use at a hatchery. I never intended to start a company and sell these, uh, you know, but that's how things go sometimes. Uh, I actually started, so uh, just an introduction to me uh, while we're on that track. Uh, I started out a long time ago uh, in the 80s, as you can see from the awesome mullet. Uh, basically, um, just freshwater stuff uh, to begin with. I grew up in North Dakota and had a lot of access to exotic marine life back then and there. Um, but along the way, I had uh, interest in all kinds of stuff, uh, marine, freshwater, uh, paludariums, even uh, cold water marine tanks at one point. Some I actually wrote a book about. Uh, just kind of all over the place and I was always I was always uh, interested in many different things that had my mind scattered so it's really surprising to me actually that I ended up settling on something so specific such a niche but again I'll, I'll get into that um, I started working in the 90s in fish stores uh, like this and um, that's mainly where I became more acquainted with saltwater stuff specifically corals uh, it was around like 94 95 that we were able to start importing corals into North Dakota and it was kind of a crash course uh, But I learned a lot there got really interested in it wanted to focus on this more as a career so uh, moved out to Oregon uh, University of Oregon and uh, Got a Bachelor of Science in Biology out there unofficially with a concentration in ecology So I did take microbiology, but that was just part of my program. I never I actually didn't think it was very interesting. Uh, I thought it was boring as hell, to be honest, um, and kind of just skated through that and never thought I'd go back to it. It was really ecology um, that uh, interested me. In fact, like my post-grad stuff, my work in hatcheries and everything, it was always, uh, I had titles like process biologist, which is basically, uh, you're an ecologist that studies captive systems, right? Uh, while I was in college, uh, one of my jobs, actually one of the longest, Hyperspace and this job now tie for the longest job I've ever had, which is only five years. I don't know if that's good or bad, but like I said, I've moved around a lot. Um, but uh, I really like this job, and I didn't think I would, uh, working in microfeed. So this was at the Zebrafish International uh, Research Center. Um, they made a whole bunch of zebrafish for, uh, as a re uh, uh, research model, right, model organism. So uh, this was the original uh, zebrafish facility. They're, they're all over the world now, and it's the zebrafish are like the white lab rat of uh, research, uh, mainly because you, they have a short lifespan. You can raise them really quick, and their embryos are clear, so they're easy to observe for developmental stuff. Uh, but that was the first place that they had done zebrafish ever, so it was really experimental. They were kind of at the forefront of everything, and that made, that made it really fun and interesting working there, uh, particularly in the microfeed thing. I thought I was going to be breeding fish when I started there. I had no idea I was going to be sitting over a microscope looking at uh, paramecia and rotifers and stuff like that, which 
I thought would have been lame, to be honest, but it was really interesting. Uh, and over time, that's kind of where I, I got my focus. So when I graduated, I went out to uh, the coast and went one year into the uh, aquarium science program and kind of further studied microfeeds and uh, got more into phytoplankton. Here we see a, a, one, a molluscan broodstock program I work in. That's all phytoplankton, these swimming pools. That's just like a third of it. Like the, another, I don't know, six or eight more of those swimming pools are in the greenhouse to the left there. But uh, we would start it out in little vials like this and, and work it up, right, into uh, larger and larger quantities. And going through that process, uh, it, it turned out to be a lot more rewarding than I ever thought it would be. Um, kind of microscopic gardening in a way or whatever, but did a lot of that. And then just as part of being anything with aquarium husbandry, uh, like that was where I lived at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. And then on the right there, uh, we did a lot of work at the Oregon Coast Aquarium, which is right there off campus making fish foods and stuff. So kind of got to develop those skills a little bit more. And I got out of that and then immediately went into work uh, in hatcheries. And since my background is in aquariums, I wanted to work with ornamental fish. Uh, went out to Tennessee. I don't know how many of you have heard of sustainable aquatics. They do, yeah, a lot of uh, clownfish. Humongous facility. So my primary job there was just raising rotifers, um, which, uh, could you know they could be boring as you probably imagine that'd be boring as hell and sometimes it was the day-to-day -day stuff but then of course because your larval fish depend on that the millions and millions of dollars of uh, livestock there were, were kind of their lives were on your shoulder because you had to have a constant supply of nutritious live feed so uh what we were doing there was uh impactful for sure uh, it was myself and another full-time employee just on that just raising live foods a little bit of uh copepods but mainly rotifers and uh, anyway, after that, I moved around a bit, ended up, that's where I finally ended up here in Colorado. Uh, wanted to get away from, I, I had been at the, on the East Coast at that time up uh, in, in Connecticut, up on New York, and decided I want to get back to like more Midwestern living and uh, came out to Colorado. And one of the first things I did was end up hooking up with a, a trout hatchery here. Um, that's actually the law. It's what we see in the picture here. It's the largest uh, private hatchery in the state. And it was really cool because everything's like big scale, really big. I mean, it's like the first job I ever had, we could actually fall in the tank and did. Um, and yes, it's extremely cold. Um, but it, and it was a hatchery in the sense that we would hatch the fish. We would bring the eggs in and hatch them and then raise them out. But the one thing that I did that was different was that uh, these. Like trout, you, like when you're feeding them, you just like, uh, you get like the fingerlings or whatever, and you're giving them like this powder. And then after that, they just progresses from gran uh, granular stuff to like these big chunks. They call it uh, trout chow, right? It's for me, it was just insanely boring because I was used to uh, putting a lot of work and effort into creating the most nutritious live food. But, you know, but it's not like marine larva culture by any means. It's like, it's just more wholesale in a way. Like the buckets, we take whole buckets and just chuck them out into the... So anyway, I was missing the important part of why I wanted to work in hatcheries. So uh, at the end of that season, I started looking for something different and found it right there in Longmont, where I was at that time, uh, at LG Barn. At that time, they were in a warehouse and uh, just doing pods and phyto. So here they, were, they weren't even raising fish, right? All they were doing is raising the live foods. Uh, and, and not just the, the phyto, but I mean, the, the copepods, but they were raising the live food for the food, the, the phytoplankton. So that was right up my alley. And I, you know, fit in right there right away. I started out writing for them. And then eventually, they were so small, it took a while before they could even take me on into the facility. They had more owners than employees when I started there. Um, but uh, one of the first problems we had uh, was, uh, or challenges, was trying to get their tigriopus pods more red. Uh, you know, like the tigger pods, we see, you know, people like that really red color. Uh, partly, you know, you can see them, that's kind of nice. But what's important nutritionally is that they're rich in uh, astaxanthin and other um, uh, carotenoids, which increases their uh, value nutritionally. So we were using a non living source of uh, carotenoids at that time that was following the water. And I'm like, well, maybe there's another way we could do this. And, and, and in researching that, I discovered something that actually uh, 
solved the issue of carotenoids and water quality issue, and that was purple non-sulfur bacteria. Uh, I'll mention the source of that in a bit, but uh, we were talking about working that into their, um, and this answers Orlando's question earlier, how I found these and how, got, how I got into this. We were, uh, I kept pushing LG Barn to make, put these in production so that we could uh, remediate our water in the warehouse and reuse that for things. And in so doing, uh, you know, the, 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 these bacteria would actually take up the waste products and then become a nutritious, uh, not only a nutritious for, food for the copepods themselves, but one that would uh, be rich in carotenoids. So by the way, uh, so the lycopene, the astaxanthin, that's why uh, these are red. So you can see it's extremely rich in uh, ma mainly lycopene, which is the same carotenoid that makes tomatoes red. Uh, but um, and then you know, they're antioxidants, so we like them because they color up stuff. Obviously, like color, you know, anything that'll color up our fish or invertebrates, that's always nice. But um, from a health, from the standpoint of health, uh, the the antioxidants obviously are, are an enormous advantage of having that in uh, your food. And, and uh, astaxanthin is almost literally worth its weight in gold. So to introduce that into a fish food is often uh, uh, prohibitive from a cost standpoint. So LG Barn, as you guys probably know, if you uh, locally, since they're local, uh, they, they did move eventually. We got huge. Um, they started getting into like uh, macro algaes and all that, and, and then all kinds of stuff. Uh, and this, the project with the bacteria just kind of got pushed to the wayside or I couldn't convince them to get it started. And uh, they got really big and moved down to Commerce City where they are to this day. And then I had to make a decision. Do I move with them? Uh, at that time I lived in the mountains in uh, a cabin. It was absolutely beautiful. And I really liked that. And uh, that option was to leave that, to move down to Commerce City, a place that smells like, uh, sorry, Commerce City, but a place that smells like dog food and, and you can't drink the water. So. I decided to just, uh, you know, um, stay where I was and maybe work on these bacteria because just in researching them, I, I found that they were pretty interesting and had a lot more um, potential uses than I had uh, actually realized, and, you know, just when I first started uh, researching them. So long story short, um, that's how I came to do what I'm doing now. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, the new... We're going to get into the nutrition, but um, I do think the the subject deserves a little bit of an overview since most hobbyists aren't that familiar with purple non-sulfur bacteria. So they got their name because the purple sulfur bacteria were discovered first. They're also like a pur they're purple because they're photosynthetic, just comes from their pigments. Uh, the the salt purple sulfur bacteria get their name because they uh, take up hydrogen sulfide and they use it as part of their metabolism. So they they turn it into elemental sulfur and uh, get energy from that. So they're nice if we have them in our tanks, uh, it's something I'm working on because they would actually get rid of sulfides, which can be toxic. The, the black stuff that smells like rotten eggs, if you dig into you know, deep mud that's stagnant or something like that. But uh, in aquaculture, it's really the purple non-sulfur bacteria that are uh, uh, really useful. Now again, they get the stupid name because they were just probably discovered after the fact. They're just non-sulfur because uh, they don't use sulfur that way. In fact, high sulfur content will kill them. Um, but otherwise, they're pretty adaptable uh, bugs, really. Uh, so they're, in my opinion, uh, this is the unofficial big three. Uh, there's, I don't expect you to remember this, these names, but you'll see them again, I promise. Not necessarily for me, but somewhere along in the future of the hobby, uh, these will become, you know, the, the use will become more prevalent as it already is in aquaculture and commercial fish farming, and shrimp farming. Rhodosunomonas, for sure, at the top of the list. Uh, that one is a lot like uh, the bacteria that we see associated with legumes. So the, the legumous plants that we plant to uh, fertilize the soil. It's not only really the plants doing that, it's the bacteria that live in association with those plants in their roots that are able to take uh, nitrogen from the air and turn it into ammonia. So they're self-fertilizing. They, they literally make uh, fertilizer out of thin air. Well, they can do the same thing with algae. Right, so they're also important in marine environments, and we're going to see the term nitrogen fixation throughout this talk. That's one of their probiotic qualities. So, by the way, when we talk about uh, using these as a food, we're talking about nutrition, but we're also talking about probiotic uh, properties. 
Rotospirillum is another one that, that's a really cool looking one. It obviously is like corkscrew shaped. It's got a spiral shape. Uh, it, that one is useful uh, in aquaculture because uh, it's good for, um, a, like for filter feeding organisms. It spends more time swimming in the water column. So uh, it's probably more likely to get picked up by like corals and clams, uh, worms, stuff like that. And then Rotobacter is just the opposite. It likes to form biofilms. So that one is the one that's going to grow on surfaces. And uh, it, uh, in so doing, it, will, it, it competes with uh, cyanobacteria really well. Since they share a lot of the same niches, they both want to live where they have access to light. Um, they're both heterotrophs. They like nutrients. Uh, I'm sorry, organic matter. Uh, so they'll fight with each other. They'll even re uh, release antibiotics, chemical warfare, and stuff like that. But there's some overlap between all these purple non-sulfur ba bacteria. But as I just mentioned, you know, they each have their own like re uh, strength, right? Where they, they they stand out somewhere or the other. Anyway, you'll see those big three pop up again. Uh, so just kind of what they look like uh, under the microscope. Since I couldn't do that here, any of you? Have, were any of you at Reefstock? Oh, well, okay. So I don't know how many of you came by my booth, but I had some of these up on the uh, microscope that we brought there. Just kind of demonstrating how they look. Uh, Rhodosudomonas, the, the big one I was talking about, they're rod shaped, so it's like, um, like a hot dog almost shape. And uh, they can join together to form like these pom-pom kind of shaped things that, they, that are referred to as rosettes. And what's important about that is, so we see up the top there, that big gob, they go from like some that's only three microns to you know much much bigger 20 30 40 microns in size the mass and that makes them more easily picked up by filter feeders right and then rotospirillum is underneath it the, the spiral guy they get really big like that really long cells and then because they, they take up more three-dimensional space because they spiral so there too it, it makes them a little bit more accessible to uh, filter feeders it makes them a little easier to grab out of the water and then Rhodobacter, I didn't put up here, but they, uh, we do Rhodobacter spheroides, and as the name implies, they're just spherical shape. They're just little balls, like one, one micron. So not much to look at, but you know, very tiny. So maybe if you're trying to do like an ornamental sponge or something like that, that would be a good one. Just something really tiny. Uh, and then, as I pointed out here, you know, the, they're usually like a reddish color. It could be reddish orange or reddish purple, depending on the species and the, and the light conditions. Um, and again, just to kind of dwell a little bit on the background before we get into nutrition, uh, they are uh, abundant on Earth. So they've been uh, isolated from deep sea sediments, forest soils, human belly button. Like they're kind of everywhere, but not necessarily in huge amounts because they have like a real specific niche. They like, they like light, but they're also anaerobic. So that presents challenges for them. They have to find a Goldilocks zone where it's anaerobic, but there's still some light penetrating. Say under right under the surface of a, a sand bed or something like that, a little pocket inside of a rock, something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so they're, they're really ancient. They're among the first uh, life forms to emerge on Earth. Definitely one of the first photosynthetic organisms. They're the ancestor of cyanobacteria, uh, right? So um, they evolved at a time when uh, Earth was very inhospitable. So they've retained a lot of uh, capabilities, uh, which makes them pretty useful uh, in aquaculture. So just to run through there, uh, uh, through, and of course might just be even using these as a food, particularly if you're trying to grow them in your food, I'm in your tank as a continual food source, as some people do. Uh, you might want to kind of know a little bit about them just to kind of promote the way they, uh, conditions for them to grow. They can grow in freshwater, by the way. Either or, I go back and forth, I'll take a freshwater culture and grow salt water with it and vice versa. Compl same strain, everything, they totally don't care. Maybe takes them a couple extra days to adapt and that's about it. Uh, so they're facultatively aerobic. Facultatively means they can be aerobic, which kind of implies that they prefer anaerobic. They can just tolerate aerobic conditions. Uh, the reason they like anaerobic conditions is because they have uh, certain advantages there. So they can only perform photosynthesis in anaerobic environments. And a part of that has to do with their photopigments and how they react with oxygen. Uh, they're, they're capable of denitrification, which is really cool. It's part of the reason they're used a lot in uh, wastewater treatment. So 
again, it has to be uh, in an anaerobic environment, but if you provide like a deep sand bed or something like that, kind of like a lot of us traditionally did. I know uh, bare bottom tanks are kind of the, the thing now, but back in the day, this is something you could have added to help uh, control nitrate accumulation. Uh, so the heterotrophs or autotrophs, you're not going to see autotrophy in an aquarium much because they have so much. So autotrophy would be like a plant, right? They use an inorganic, they auto-applying, they do it themselves. They can take like carbon dioxide and make their own carbon source for their own food. Uh, so like a plant takes up CO2, they can do that. But in an aquarium, they're almost always going to rely on heterotrophy. They just eat stuff like you or me or starfish or any other heterotrophic bacteria. You're targeting when you put in uh, vinegar or, or, or uh, vodka or something like that, right? So any kind of organic source to grow them. And they do prefer uh, heterotrophy anyway. So by the way, they're, they're in a weird class of organisms. They're called hetero, uh, photoheterotrophs. So they get their uh, energy from light, but they're carbon for growth, mainly from organic substances. Uh, and then finally, um, ca they're capable of nitrogen fixation, like I mentioned before, and I'll mention again. They take nitrogen gas and they turn it into ammonia, almost the opposite of denitrification, right? Um, and they only do that where uh, nitrogen is limiting. And you're going to see that a lot in a, in a healthy coral reef where nitrate is almost non-detectable, same with ammonia and all that. So they flourish in those environments because they don't, their growth isn't limited by uh, those, you know, they can live in an infertile environment because they just take nitrogen the atmosphere is like 80% nitrogen gas. It's unlimited to them. So that's how, uh, and they, uh, only cyanobacteria, these guys, and then a small handful of other bacteria can actually do this. So they're really important ecologically. They introduce all biologically available nitrogen into an ecosystem. So all this versatility makes them uh, pretty amenable for aquacultural use, um, particularly if they are nutritious, right? And they most certainly are nutritious, as we'll get into. But um, all these things together is, uh, has made them attractive to fish farms and, and uh, shrimperies, stuff like that, all the way back into the 1970s. So like half a century, uh, there have been industries that have been using this stuff pretty extensively. Um, also as a probiotic, so they control uh, diseases like Vibrio, things like that, that might be prevalent in a high density aquaculture situation. We've seen that with the shrimp industry. They practically saved the Pacific white shrimp industry from a, a, a Vibrio uh, infection. Uh, so all in all, what we, say, what we call this in aquaculture is that it makes good circular economy. In other words, you put in this bacteria, they're actually going to clean up your water. And in so doing, they reproduce and they grow, but then they themselves become, they take that waste and then they turn it into something that's nutritious for the stuff you're trying to raise, right? And... Uh, it, it, for that same reason now, um, it was rotospiro in the corkscrew one. Like right now, the European Space Agency is uh, investigating, and have been for a long time, investigating the use of those bacteria to put on manned uh, missions to Mars for wastewater recovery. So uh, definitely something to it. They're good at it, and they actually have no uh, downsides in terms of, uh, like, they don't release any toxic chemicals, or they can't go pathogenic or anything like that. Uh, they're completely benevolent. So I, I don't think anybody here is like interested in like raising tilapia or anything like that. So um, that's great that they're using aquaculture, but we're all wondering, well, what the hell are we going to do with these in our aquariums, right? And the first, pe first thing people usually ask, uh, especially reef aquarists, are, are do these things actually grow in, uh, in the wild? Are these actual reef aquariums? We were like, talking about this earlier, actually. Um, are they just like probiotic? Uh, you know, human probiotics that are pe that people are throwing in like fish foods and stuff, are they actually naturally occurring reef bacteria? And they are. So, you know, why would I put this in my tank? And the other question we get all the time is, are they actually going to keep living in my aquarium or do I have to keep buying this crap over and over and over and over again, right? And uh, the answer is maybe, <laughs> uh, but we'll get to that. First of all, yes, they, they are naturally occurring in coral reefs. In fact, they're extremely abundant and they play an enormous ecological role, not the least of which being nitrogen fixation, like I just mentioned. Um, so if you look at this list, you know, at the top, it's what you'd expect to see pelagibacter, probably the most numerous, it, uh, I wouldn't say abundant, most numerous organism on earth. Uh, they're, they're hugely uh, valuable. Corals do eat them, by the way, and if you use UV, you're killing almost all of them. Uh, unfortunately, 
but uh, you know, you've got that one. Then right below it are two cyanobacteria, two more nitrogen fixers, uh, pelagic cyanobacteria, not the kind that we hate and that grow all over stuff, but they're more like the phytoplankton. They're an important source of food as well. Uh, but you know, going down the line, we see a whole bunch, and, but you don't go far down. This is only the top 18 out of maybe hundreds or even thousands of genera that are gonna, you're gonna find on a healthy coral reef, right? Uh, so all of the big three that I mentioned, the big three purple non-sulfur bacteria, are on this list. In fact, Rhodopseudomonas is in the top 10, mixed in with other nitrogen fixers. But then we got Rhodobacter, and we have Rhodospirulum down there. So obviously, they don't just occur there, but they um, are extremely abundant, uh, according to this study, anyway. Uh, so this kind of goes back to like, so yeah, so why, when, I, when I first found out about these, it was actually from uh, the third volume of Julian Sprung and Charles uh, Delbeck's book, The Reef Aquarium. And, he, and Julian just met, it was actually Julian who wrote about it, he told me later, but uh, he, um, th he just mentions them in like a paragraph or two, and that's what I saw that sparked all this, like in how I, you know, how I first uh, wanted to rec you know, introduce this into algae barns protocol for raising uh, copepods, generally, if not just Tigriopus. And uh, you know, I started learning, wow, they have all these other benefits nutritionally, and they have these probiotic things. So this is mainly, if you're going to ask the question, why would I put this in my tank? It's because uh, they have proven uh, positive effects on reef environments and reef animals, all the way to fish, as we'll see. And yes, they do persist in the tank, at least in some situations. Uh, the problem in, with a lot of reef tanks is that they have too much nitrate, and that promotes the growth of uh, bacteria that wouldn't necessarily live on a reef. Remember, coral reefs are nitrogen limited, and that favors all those uh, uh, nitrogen fixers that I was just pointing out. On that list, at least half of them are nitrogen fixers, and they're actually fairly rare among bacteria, right? But they're, but they're really well represented on a coral reef because they're more competitive there, right? So I'm seeing faces. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah. So. Uh, if you get in an environment where like nitrogen is not available, it actually limits the growth of a lot of bacteria that otherwise grow pretty aggressively. So Alteromonas, Pseudalteromonas that we saw on that list, they were on there, but on, in an aquarium, they're going to be way at the top. So if you guys know who Aquabiomics is, those are more, uh, those, those types of bacteria, copiotrophic in, st in the sort, those sorts that like high nutrients, uh, they are going to uh, dominate in an aquarium environment because even the cleanest aquariums are kind of like filth pits compared to like a, a normal, healthy coral reef, certainly a pristine reef. So you don't necessarily expect to see these in an aquarium all the time. It depends on the aquarium's microbiome, uh, whether or not these bacteria can live or not. Uh, Orlando was discussing uh, earlier how you might uh, promote their growth by putting them in a reactor or something like that. There's actually one of the things that Julian mentioned in that book too. He put forth this idea that maybe you can grow purple non-sulfur bacteria in reactors and uh, treat them like we do like a phytoplankton reactors and just kind of let them feed into the tank little by little. But, uh, you know, in some cases they do live in the tank. And here, this is Reef Builders Studio. Um, Jake Adams was using our stuff uh, from a few months prior um, to, where, to when we lost him. And, uh, I had the opportunity to go into the studio a few months after that and uh, do a, a, a run a, a test for aquabiomics, collect some samples. And lo and behold, uh, Rhodopseudomonas does show up in one of their systems that we tested. And weirdly enough, you know, uh, Jake famously hated uh, substrates, right? So these tanks were really clean. They didn't, I, they had minimal or no biomedia and like no substrate. And somehow the bacteria were persisting, and it would make sense to me to think that they were actually living on or in the corals, as they do. We'll get into that a bit, too. But they actually have probiotic uh, properties that, where they're associated with corals symbiotically, which is kind of cool. Uh, that It's the exact same species as we sell, in fact. Um, but we'll get into that again a bit. Just to like give an overview on like the nutritional benefits, and an honest one. Um, so the real benefit of these guys is their protein. Uh, they, probably because they're nitrogen fixers, they have no limit for nitrogen. So they can make all the amino acids and therefore all the proteins that they desire. 
uh, they're often, they're, the 30 percent we get here is from a study where they were on like Sago wastewater or something, like a really poor growth environment for them. Under ideal conditions, they can, they're more, they're, uh, they can be over 70 percent protein, which is insane. Uh, they're actually being looked at for just to be grown in mass now uh, for aquaculture feeds or even like human feeds. Uh, just for that, that alone, just the, their ability to, 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 to generate crude protein. Uh, in addition to that, a lot of vitamins, especially B vitamins, um, some fatty acids like stearic acid and oleic acid, as I understand, are not particularly abundant. They're not essential, I don't think, but they are in, uh, they're usually not um, abundant in a lot of prepared fish foods. So it's kind of nice to have that added. Uh, the, the carotenoids, as we mentioned, obviously are uh, hugely important. Um, I would say in a lot of cases, that's a, that they would be like the number one additive for a lot of different things. Uh, if you're just looking at general probiotics, just for that, that cherry on top. Uh, and then uh, the polysaccharides and energy source, right? They're just uh, carbs, uh, not too important. And then, uh, you know, they're highly digestible compared to phytoplankton. So unlike uh, uh, phytoplankton or your uh, veggies, any plant, right? Uh, they have a cell wall that has cellulose in it. And uh, that is not, well, it's fiber, right? So it's not digestible. These guys are just, back, they have a bacterial cell wall. It's completely digestible. So they're a lot easier on the digestive tract of a lot of animals. So all those things together make them uh, pretty attractive as a feed in aquaculture, just generally for any kind of organism, really. They're, they're pretty well balanced in and of themselves, but for one thing, um, they're not particularly rich in uh, lipids or fatty acids. Which is a problem. We all know a lot of us saying we know the importance of hoofas in our own diet and the fish we feed us. We do like cell, cell, cell con, cell con stuff like that uh, to enrich those diets. Make sure that they have those fatty acids because we can't make them ourselves. We have to get them in our diet. And unfortunately, uh, these bacteria don't necessarily produce a lot of that. So no one food is perfect. These guys, unfortunately, are no exception to that rule. But you can mitigate that somewhat by uh, combining with uh, other foods. So uh, phytoplankton happens to be pretty crappy when it comes to protein. Uh, they're not necessarily rich in B vitamins, and they're uh, and they're not always that uh, they're not as digestible because of the cell wall that you're going to see in any algae or plant. So th there was actually a study they used brine shrimp as a model organism, and they found that the diet of those uh, critters was actually better when you had a mix of the two than with either one by itself, right? So especially in a situation where you're, try where you're really trying to grow something, you want, you, want, you, want per you want production, you need that protein. So even though you also need the fatty acids, it sometimes means that you have to uh, uh, combine your foods. So we couldn't, we couldn't live off of beef alone, we couldn't live off of lettuce alone, but you know, you combine your meat and veggies, same thing for most organisms. Uh, so in a reef tank, how this works is um, you're, I like to call it a reef food rather than uh, like a coral food. I even say, well, does it say? Live bacteria is also. Uh, uh, you know, we, often we say it's a coral diet, and it is. And I guess that's just marketing. You know, most people are going to be interested in feeding their corals, but really this feeds the reef in the sense that uh, it's more holistic. So, yes, uh, you know, it, it's kind of you're starting at the bottom of the food chain up, right? So we don't talk about like protozoa, protists in our, in our tanks, but they're, they're quite prevalent on a reef. In fact, one study I saw, copepods, their main diet isn't like phytoplankton or stuff like that. It's or detritus. It's actually protists. And protists eat a lot of bacteria, an insane amount. So um, really, you know, you could put the, you put like this stuff in your tank, you know, the protists eat it, uh, or, you know, the, uh, your copepods will actually eat your protists, but the copepods will eat this directly. Same thing with corals. Your corals will eat this directly, but they'll also eat the protists, or they might eat the copepods that ate the protists that ate the bacteria. So you get my point, right? Same thing with uh, sponges, tunicates, all that. It just kind of travels up the food chain. Things like the fatty, uh, fatty acids from, like, say, your, well, these guys too, but, or, or your phytoplankton more so. Certainly, like the carotenoids. These are things like, think salmon, right? Those things travel up the food chain. They're not necessarily just digested and, and uh, eliminated or destroyed or whatever. They're, they can be passed on. 
So that's how we get a lot of reds and a lot of our critters, right? Um, and the whole cell source of uh, astaxanthin, for example, as I understand it, is superior than just putting like pure astaxanthin in a food because it has to be, it's like fat soluble. So the animal can actually take up more of it and utilize it better if it's mixed in with their food in that way than if you just throw like an expensive powder on your stuff. Corals. Uh, so the, the important thing to remember here, even if you're not necessarily using pro, pro bio or whatever, like if you're really trying to grow up corals and create a natural environment for corals, in other words, if you're trying to replicate their natural environment, and certainly that would include trying to replicate their natural diet, you, wouldn't you certainly wouldn't be dumping things, not to say reflurase is bad, but, uh, but you, wouldn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily be doing that. You would be adding uh, live foods. And the bulk of their uh, planktonic diet, if you will, is not necessarily uh, zooplankton. It's not even phytoplankton. It's uh, bacterial plankton uh, by far. Uh, obviously, bacteria are very, very tiny, but they consume an enormous amount of bacteria. Bacteria are quite prevalent on a coral reef, mainly because they feed on the organics that are there that are supplied largely by coral mucus, uh, perhaps other things, but, but they're quite abundant, and that's mainly what coral feed on. Um, so, you know, something like this is where you can have a concentrated, people say, well, I already have bacteria in my tank, but uh, you aren't necessarily going to have enough to supply you have a whole big tank of corals in a little bit of water, and they're just filtering the same water over and over again, they'll very quickly eliminate that food source. Like if you, something more visible, if you've added phytoplankton, you see the green water, and like an hour later, it goes clear, right? Um, it obviously doesn't last very long. Uh, so something concentrated like this is, uh, makes it more convenient and, and you can uh, add like a larger amount if you wanna get that growth. And the added benefit too, as opposed to, if I pick on a different food, I don't wanna keep ripping on reef, uh, reefroids, but any other kind of powdered food, uh, those foods are, you know, dead foods, if you will. They're going to pollute your water, obviously, over time, the waste products from all that. Whereas these bacteria, because of the ability to, to consume organic matter, uh, take up ammonia, nitrate, phosphate, uh, the more of this you add, uh, rather than polluting the water, you're actually cleaning the water more because their ability to, to bioremediate. So... How do they actually capture bacteria generally? Uh, not just these bacteria, but any. That's always a question I get. And they just capture it in their mucus. So it doesn't matter if you have an LPS. Oh, they have a big mouth. Well, that's not the point. Uh, they're just capturing it in their mucus, and they have cilia that brush that mucus into their mouth all day long. So it's not just like at night where they're feeding on, primarily when they feed on phyto, or I'm sorry, zooplankton. Uh, all day long, they're feeding on uh, bacterial plankton. So symbiotic uh, in the sense that yeah, they are nitrogen fixers inside of the corals. So uh, corals like, uh, so most of the corals we keep are, are, are uh, hermatypic corals. They, they have zooxanthellae uh, in them. Uh, these, uh, if, you, if you were gonna really be particular, you'd say that these uh, bacteria are really benefiting, they benefit the coral, but uh, nutritionally, because they do eat the bacteria, and the bacteria is insanely nutritious, but, uh, they're also benefiting the zooxanthellae because they're fixing nitrogen. So in an environment where there isn't a lot of, 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 of nitrogen available, and by the way, they don't, zooxanthellae don't prefer nitrate. Uh, some, they can almost do nothing with nitrate. They prefer ammonia. So when these bacteria are, are cranking out, you know, say the say the nitrogen is limiting, like you're near bottoming out, then they'll start making ammonia, and they say they are, they're leaky. So they leak a little bit, and then the... Uh, the zooxanthellae can take that up and use that as a nitrogen source because they prefer ammonia, which they get from the, the coral polyp itself. But if you want fast growth, the more the better. So, uh, and, then the, and then the probiotic effects, of course, if, if, if it's not necessarily, it blurs the line, right? Like uh, the nitrogen fixation, that's sort of diet, but it's also symbiotic because they live inside the coral and they do all this stuff. They have associations with the zooxanthellae as well as the polyp. Um, so you could call that probiotic, but they do have uh, specific uh, probiotic properties as well in that they inhibit disease, organism, it, disease organisms. So that would be obviously Vibrio because they're known, they've been shown repeatedly to inhibit Vibrio, which is a common uh, coral pathogen in the wild and in our aquariums. But I've seen more evidence uh, recently from other papers that they inhibit other diseases like black band. 
uh, probably more directly and more conclusively that it's actually Rhodocinomonas in that case. So fish, uh, again, we, we know how fish would eat them, right? Like how fish could eat these bacteria? Picking on the rocks. So copepods, your copepods are going to eat these uh, bacteria, and they're, they're going to be more productive. You'll have more, uh, your gobies, little guys that can eat stuff like that, but uh, the bacteria tend to live on algae. So when you have uh, fish swimming around, your herbivores eating algae, they're taking it, taking it up that way as well. And it'll help them uh, digest their food. Again, because they digest cellulose, you see a disproportionate advantage to herbivores, in fact, because while it's in their guts, these bacteria can actually help break down that cellulose. Because the fish cannot, but then the, these bacteria live off of that, and then in so doing, uh, generate all kinds of vitamins and things, so they, the fish get more food. Uh, that, that's actually where they're used mainly in a pro, uh, as a probiotic in fish hatcheries, by the way. They call it feed conversion. Uh, in essence, in the shortest way possible of putting it, they, the fish digests more of its food, uh, so you spend less on food, but in so doing it also generates less waste, right? So then they, the, the, they pollute the water less. So it's kind of a win-win a from both ends of the fish's butt, if I may. Uh, so again, I, I don't want to dwell on this, too, well, I do want to dwell on this, but we only have so much time, but I just want to like hammer it in that how important the uh, nitrogen fixation is on a normal, healthy coral reef. We have a lot of people dosing nitrate right now in the hobby, and it makes absolute no, no sense because the corals either cannot use it or they can barely use it. Uh, if if we, when we see them using it at all, it's not necessarily that they're taking up the nitrate, probably, but they're, uh, we're promoting the growth of algae and uh, other bacteria and stuff like that that the coral are then eating. Right, so it's not as direct, and what you have in that issue then is you're promoting the growth of things you don't want—bad bacteria, algae, stuff like that. So rather than uh, even dosing ammonia now, people have finally figured that out. Oh, corals only take up ammonia now. They're dosing even just very recently now. People are talking about dosing ammonia, and I'm hoping finally we get to like no. What we need to do is put in nitrogen-fixing bacteria because the ammonia too. You put that in the water, and aside from the obvious risks of putting ammonia into your tank, right? you misread a test kit or something like that and you overdose, we, obviously we're going to have issues with that. The other thing is you're still going to have, you're also going to be promoting the growth of things you don't want, especially algae, right? In this case, with the, the bacteria live inside of the coral. They're taking up, so they're, they're producing ammonia uh, from nitrogen gas. So you don't add anything. And then that's used up inside the coral polyp. So you can maintain a low ammonia and nitrate level in the water column and, and inhibit algae growth, but at the same time, generate all of the uh, bioavailable nitrogen that the coral and the zooxanthellae need to live, right? Uh, real quick, like this is just kind of interesting. The, the, when, when Charles Darwin went to Tahiti and studied a coral reef for the first time, he was blown away by the fact that the water was crystal clear. In other words, it was uh, infertile. Right? It didn't have a lot of phytoplankton in it. And yet, the, the coral reefs are insanely uh, productive and diverse and dynamic. And he's like, how the hell is this occurring? Um, he never did figure it out. For all the things he figured out, that was not one of them. And uh, it became known as Darwin's paradox. How, how are these reefs so... Every, people speculate everything from bird shit to all kinds of things, right? And it never made sense from the scale of a coral reef how much nitrogen that takes and where that was coming from. And then in the 70s, they finally figured it out. Well, it's nitrogen-fixing bacteria. They were like, there's more nitrate coming off the reef than going onto it. How the hell is that? And then they discovered these bacteria, and they're like, hmm, okay. So there's this, corals are this, what they call now, a holobiont. It's like a superorganism. It's not just the, the coral and the zooxanthellae, which are, they fix carbon and they make carbohydrates and you know, they, they can do that, but then there are also these nitrogen fixing bacteria and other types of bacteria that all together kind of form what is what they call the holobiont. Um, anyway, so they figured out the Darwin's paradox, and now there have been thousands of papers specifically written just about uh, the relationship of, cor of uh, corals with uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria, and that research continues. Um, but, I don't, did I hit that hard enough? Um, so, okay, so just to get a little bit more into, I know this is kind of, no one cares in the aquarium industry about sulfur oxidation. And frankly, I don't know if we should or not, if it's really a big thing. 
uh, depends on like what, what, what new disease is around the corner, right? Uh, but it turns out that in a study of uh, corals in Bermuda, um, there's an association with uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, cyanobacteria, and sulfate-reducing bacteria. Now, those are the, those are the ones that take, uh, they make hydrogen sulfide, right? So they make the, stu the, the black stuff that smells like rotten eggs or beer fart, or, <laughs> right? And uh, somehow, uh, there was some imbalance between the two. Mainly, there was a, a relative uh, abundance of the sulfate reducers compared to the nitrogen fixers. And, uh, and, and, and these, uh, which well, I should say, actually, in this case, well, they happen to be uh, nitrogen fixers, I'm sorry, but they were sulfate, uh, sulfur oxidizers. And uh, to which all the big three, again, we see Rhodopseudomonas, Rhodospirulum, Rhodobacter, all three of our, uh, our purple non sulfur bacteria, right? Well, they're in this huge, they're in this group of, uh, of, uh, of sulfur oxidizers, so they counter the activity of the sulf, the uh, the, the the sulfate, uh, sulfur reducer, sulf, sulf, sulfate reducing bacteria that make hydrogen sulfide. Long story short, uh, if you have a lot of uh, the the good guys, the sulfur oxidizers, like these purple non-sulfur bacteria, it, re it reduces the activity of the of the um, sulfate uh, reducers. Uh, uh, so. But by the way, it doesn't mean they're reducing the amount of, it means they're chemically reducing the sulfate, the op opposite of oxidase, oxidation. So they're, they're turning sulfate into hydrogen sulfide, the black. And maybe, I don't even know if that's why the bands in black band disease are black. But in any case, it, it's a really destructive disease. And it's an example of where these uh, bacteria uh, play a role as probiotics naturally with corals. So here we see Rhodosunomonas at the very top, actually, among the bacteria that they found on, uh, especially the four reef zone, um, uh, where black band tends to be really destructive, uh, they found that Rhodopseudomonas alone, the, the, the sole bacteria in PNS probial, Rhodopseudomonas palustris, uh, accounted for a quarter of all the genes that were associated with sulfur oxidation. And, uh, but again, we see, you know, the, 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 Big three, you know, we get Rhodospirulin and Rhodo, uh, uh, Rhodobacter in there as well. So this is an example of where, you know, diseases that we may not even be aware are, are, are here yet or they're here to come. Uh, these naturally probiotic uh, and beneficial bene uh, bacteria may play a role in uh, preventing or uh, controlling some of those diseases. So in terms of feeding, uh, what do we do with this stuff, right? How do, is it complicated? Do we have to put them in a, a doser or some crap like that? Nope, you can just uh, broadcast feed them. You literally just take the bottle and pour it over the top. Uh, you can't overdose. We've tried. We've literally tried to overdose with these bacteria and couldn't do it, like at 40 time overdoses. So if I, if I had more people doing that, I'd make a lot of money. But uh, at that point, at that point, you'd actually, because it's a, they're made in freshwater. At that point, I was just like, okay, I give up now because I've actually, it's like, I've reduced the salinity to the point where if uh, I've added so much of this that uh, if I see any ill effects on the corals, it might be from the hypo salinity than anything else. But uh, yeah, they just open up and they're like, give me more. You know, it's, it's just like phytoplankton or anything else. You can't really overdose it per se. Uh, and again, they actually clean up after themselves. They improve the water quality rather than degrade it. So, uh, go, you know, it's easy to broadcast feed, and particularly, again, since it's like a holistic food, you're feeding everything, your copepods, everything. So there's no point in target feeding even, where you'd sit on one little coral and squirt it. You just put it in, and, you know, they're going to, they're going to hit your tridacnid clams, uh, any kinds of bivalves you may have in there, like, uh, but uh, tube worms, stuff like that. Um, and uh, kind of, it's just simple and easy, which is always good. If, we spend less time feeding, we have more time to spend on other aspects of our husbandry, right? So we can do, we can improve our tanks in other ways. How's it going? Uh, another way is to, and this is my favorite way actually, is to uh, apply them as a food soak. And it doesn't really take any more work because we feed our fish more or less every day. Some of us three, four times a day. Um, but uh, 
if you just work that into your um, regular feeding regimen, it just makes it just one more simple thing. You just pour it in a little bit and you're good, right? And just uh, from a, having a background in hatcheries and labs and stuff, practicality is big for me. So anything like that where I don't have to worry about overdosing it or having it foul right away or something like that, it's really nice. So um, from that aspect, it's, it makes it simple, but you can actually get more out of it that way, right? So if you put it in your, your you can soak it in like coral foods, by the way. Any way that the animal actually ingests it, they're going to get more into their gut. And that way, it'll, uh, the more cells you have, the more probiotic benefit you're going to get, obviously, right? So especially with fish, that's more or less the, the main way they're going to get any good concentration of it is through uh, like a food soak. Hey, guys. So that's kind of my favorite way to do it. And that's how I tend to recommend it now because it's something... Every, we all do different things. Every aquarium, ha every aquarist has, a, has their own kind of method over time, at least. But everybody feeds their fish, and this is definitely the best time to do it. Um, simply because if you just put it in their food, you're going to be delivering it to the gut. Obviously, not all of it's going to go there. It doesn't just stick to the food, especially without a binder. You're going to be broadcasting it anyway. But it, at least this way, we get it into the, uh, more of it into the animal gut. Um, so I mentioned dosers. I'm not big on dosers. Um, I haven't tried it myself, and I haven't seen a lot of people do it. So I can't say anything bad about it from experience. It's just, theoretically, what's the point? Like, if you can't overdose this stuff, it's kind of a waste of a doser, in my opinion, right? Like, you just take a bottle, chug it, you know, once a day or whatever, throw it over your food, and you're good to go. You never really have to worry about overdoing it. So if you have a doser, you could use it for something more important, you know, something that you actually could overdose with. Um, the other, and, and the other reason, too, is like, uh, the, you know, you do have cells that settle out. So as it grows, you'll see the cells in suspension swimming around. But the, the, the mature cells tend to settle out, and you'll see like a red sediment at the bottom. It, it's, it's not like detritus or anything. They're, it's live material. But these are cells that have lost their flagellum, their, their little thing that they swim with. And they just lay on the bottom and they want to form biofilms. And that stuff the, will settle to a point where, like, if you have a doser, you might just be pulling only that. You might be pulling only the solution. And in other words, it's not going to be a consistent delivery unless you have a mixer, which makes it even more, the, a doser would make it even more complicated. So I'm not, I'm not big on applying it that way. If anybody has another way of, you know, if, if wants to try it, I don't see any problem with it, except that you've got to keep your lines clean. Uh, I don't know that they would grow in the lines and clog them all the time or not, but it's it's a possibility. So reactors are a little bit different. Again, I don't. I've always been like more on the biological side of things. I, I'm not big on equipment or technology. I never have been. I don't even understand a lot of it. For as long as I've been in the hobby, there are stu there are things that are like I'm still lost on because I just don't get into like all the tech. Uh, but this is one thing I can get behind reactors. Specifically because it's one of those things where if, if you're growing it in the system, then you have a continuous supply of it, right? It, it would be a, the reactors are like what would put me out of business, I guess. Um, because uh, once, you know, people, if, if, if you had a way to keep growing it uh, on site, then, you know, it's just the gift that keeps on giving, right? Uh, more of an investment, but then after that initial high investment, um, you really wouldn't have to do much up to it at all. It would just um, keep cranking out uh, bacteria. And it can get really weird, too. Like, these bacteria can take up, like, they can utilize infrared for photosynthesis. So we've seen some people develop, like, reactors where they'll, they'll only put, like, uh, infrared on it to inhibit so that you don't have cyanobacteria or algae growing in it. And it can get really – so, obviously, these are examples from the lab. Uh, Something, you know, so we would, if it was something made for the aquarium, it would look a little bit more elegant. And I have seen there's a guy that um, is working on something like this right now. I've been in communication with. I don't know how, how far along he is, but uh, it looks a little bit more like the conventional aquarium reactor. And uh, we'll see where he gets with that. But uh, it's definitely one of those things. And just like uh, Julian Sprung suggested like 18 years ago, uh, a, a, a a plankton reactor would be like the best thing for uh, purple non-sulfur bacteria, probably, if you wanted like a large continuous supply. Uh, and then in terms of other applications, potentially they're not available yet, but dried. Uh, it's one of those things where if we really wanted the convenience, we could put it in our food. 
They do survive uh, freeze drying, though it's unclear how well. It would depend on the process. It's not an easy one. It's something we've just invested a lot of time and money into to looking into. So that's actually our uh, centrifuge on the left, uh, 10,000 Gs. <laughs> so it's, uh, we're going to handle at one and a half horsepower. So it's a tremendously huge, uh, um, huge uh, unit. It, we might be able to handle large amounts and produce a lot amount of a huge amount of powder. And on the right is our freeze dryer for that. Haven't even fired them up yet. I've just been too busy keeping up with uh, regular day-to-day -day stuff. But um, that could, you know, it's something we're working on, and we'll have to see about the viability. If if they're not viable, they still have use as a, a food item, right? So it's something that you can mix in conveniently with uh, any other your dry foods, or kind of soak it into like your if you're thawing out like frozen foods, something like that. And then you'd still have these whole like the whole cell uh but dried or rehydrated um cell that you know all of your phytoplankton eating organisms could take up uh and if they're viable that's great because then uh you know when the animals eat that then they will wake up inside the gut and uh and uh put forth those probe you know uh increasing feed conversion fighting off pathogens stuff like that but uh we have to actually dry it and see how many survive before i can start talking about viability when you freeze dry, though, the nutritional, all the nutritional stuff that we just talked about, pretty much intact. Freeze drying is a really good way to preserve stuff. But anyway, that, that's kind of what we're working on at present. Uh, anything else in the future? I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. So, like, we got people who want to put it in with phytoplankton right now. Um, and I'm going way outside of the, you know, I started out with aquariums, and now I have, like, a biotech company I'm working with out uh, west that wants to, uh, they're actually drying it. So I'll we'll work with them figuring out how to dry it, but they want to put it in soils to get rid of hydrocarbons, oil spills and stuff like that. So huge applications, but right now I'm just focusing on the aquarium industry. I pretty much, uh, you know, this is going to be a, 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 a mullet to bald, bald and gray kind of thing for me. I'm a lifelong hobbyist. I'm, this is what I'm always going to do. I'm always going to be focused on this end of, uh, of the use of these bacteria. but. Um, for sure, you know, I'm always going to be involved with the hobby and hopefully hobbyists will be involved with us. So like our hobby just kind of like, we see a lot, like especially at shows where there's a lot of uh, cross involvement between users and not always, not always pleasant and go <laughs> reef to reef and get ripped apart or whatever. But I think all of that is good. Like the hobby helps us develop products. You guys say what you like, you say what you don't like, you, you, um, you can, uh, 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 voice skepticism, things like that, right? And it definitely drives uh, development at, at the at our end. And of course, because we're also hobbyists predominantly, we listen and we care. So uh, with that, hopefully, um, you know, I'll get a lot of feedback from you guys in the future. Uh, I'd like to see more of you using it. How, by the way, how many have used this product before? Oh, wow. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, with that, um, I would just say keep letting, if there's anything you like, don't like, always let me know if there's another a new application you know of that might be good. Uh, we always want to hear it because, uh, you know, we're out here doing this for you. Uh, so that concludes the talk. With that, um, I, would, uh, I would open up the floor to questions. Question. Um, I'm making an assumption in my head. Um, when you apply this and put it in the tank, you need to shut your tank. But mm. are, you, are you, the whole system is soaking? Good question. Um, mechanical filtration, no. They're tiny. They're just a few microns. Very few of us run mechanical filtration capable of entrapping something this small. Uh, but uh, come on in. And uh, on the other hand, UV definitely will kill them. Uh, we're on the fence about skimmers. Uh, there have been good, some good studies looking at how much bacteria is removed, but that depends so much on uh, the brand of skimmer, the, the, the conditions inside the aquarium, the water, like the pH, things like that will affect that, and even the species of bacteria. So we really don't know how much. I certainly don't know like what percentage of bacteria these guys would be removed by a skimmer under given conditions, but it's a possibility to think about if you want to cut your skimmer. I always advise no for the reason that 
uh, not a lot will get removed anyway in the amount of time it takes for these guys to get removed. Uh, uh, you know, the corals will eat them as fast as it's getting skimmed. And I'd rather just not mess with the skimmer. Like half the time your pump won't come back on, right? <laughs> and you're sitting there playing with that for a half hour. It's just not worth it. Like uh, uh, some people would say otherwise, I don't think it's that expensive, the product. So I just like throw it in and let it go. So I don't worry about any of that. Now with UV, if you're using it as a food primarily, not an issue. I mean, you can irradiate with the UV and so what, right? It's still floating around and it's, it has the exact same nutrition. That's totally cool. Uh, if you're trying to grow it in your tank, if you're trying to seed it or inoculate your tank, then you might want to cut your uh, ultraviolet sterilizer for like 12 hours, 24 hours, the longer the better. Give it more of a chance to settle in, find those spots where it will uh, best thrive and, uh, and uh, do that without getting killed. But, and then uh, ozone definitely too. Not a lot of us use ozone now these days, but ozone definitely would wipe them out as well. Carbon dosing, some people if you ask if you have to carbon dose, obviously that would help. Uh, if you chose to use uh, something like vinegar, that, uh, that's acid. They, they, they prefer um, uh, acetate over like uh, methanol. So I'd, I'd use, uh, I would carbon dose with uh, vinegar before I would vodka, for example. But the nice thing is because they use carbon sources that other bacteria cannot, for example, the cellulose, again, they break down all that, uh, the, the dead cell walls, the algae, stuff like that. Uh, they're really gonna be, they're really gonna attack your detritus. And we do see this a lot. People say their filter socks clog up less often using this, or they just see less pools in their uh, overflow box and stuff like that. So, uh, hey guys. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't necessarily, I've never recommended carbon dosing, but if you did and you were really trying to encourage these guys to grow, I would suggest uh, vinegar because they love acetate, acetic acid and alkaline. So, and I can't think of anything else, like really just, uh, you know, they live off of, they're, they're very uh, competitive. So if they're gonna die in a tank, it's not really anything you did, it's because of the competition from the, the resident com competing microbes. Yep. Substrate sauce, yeah. Uh, it was probably a good time to say, um, I haven't announced this, but at, we are working on combining the two. So Substrate Sauce came out after ProBio came out. So at that time, we'd already uh, started cultivating Rhodospirillum. Uh, one of the big differences is that this has two species in it. It has a Rhodopseudomonas in it, but it also has Rhodospirillum. We are going to uh, redo PNS ProBio, uh, improve, new and improved to include all three of the big three that we've mentioned throughout the, the presentation. Um, and then uh, there will be no more substrate sauce. So not much of a big difference there, except for like substrate sauce is cultivated in salt water. So if you're trying to cycle, that was the idea, right? It was, it was a cycling product primarily. And having it in salt water, if you're using it in a salt water application, uh, they just wake up faster. They'll, they'll do the same if they're fresh, you know, if they come from a fresh water. Uh, culture, but it was just to speed it up because most people want to speed up the process of cycling anyway. But I mean, it, the, the three days you shave off, I mean, in retrospect, it's like, yes, it's nice, but their value really is denitrifiers, and that won't become impo important for like a week or two down the road anyway, right? And uh, another thing that substrate sauce has a purposeful excess of uh, phosphate in it. So we, a, a full, at a full dose, it increases your phosphates by about 0.05 parts per million and the reason for that is nowadays when we're using like uh, dry rock and we're doing like fishless cycling methods uh, we're not introducing enough phosphorus into the system to support the kind of prolific microbial growth that we're hoping for during the cycling period so that kind of just promotes the growth of uh, all kinds of bacteria really but it's, you know really it's really designed for the one just at least to get the ones we want going so anyway, I, I don't think a lot of people like that. Uh, some people are, for one reason or another, maybe they didn't ha uh, filter their water really well when they were starting their tanks and they already had phosphorus anyway. Just starting out cycling, they already had like too much phosphate and stuff like that. And you know, it's like potassium phosphate is cheap enough. I'll let people buy that their own and, and dose it as they please. So we just thought in the spirit of keeping it simple, we we're gonna have one product. So anyway, if that answers your pre question about the difference, I hope it does, but also uh, you can look forward to these being pretty much the same thing with all the same benefits in one bottle, all three species. 
So uh, whereas this one is, the, the one with the most has two species now, ProBio is actually going to have three sometime in the near future. Oh, I'm sorry. What's that? <laughs> I was I saw a different hand, and then <laughs> freshwater. Yeah, yeah. So I think I mentioned uh, nitrogen fixation quite a bit. Uh, same thing there in freshwater tanks, right? So um, they are used in the uh, horticultural industry extensively as quote unquote biofertilizers. So everything from cannabis to uh, uh, PGA golf courses. I wish I was selling it to them, but um, Rhodocinomonas palustris. And that's because they uh, can take nitrogen gas and turn it into ammonia and then they fertilize, right? So same thing like if you have a planted tank. Uh, the probiotic, you know, we see, we see vibriotic diseases in freshwater. So uh, different wasting diseases in fish and so forth. Um, so they, they confer those benefits that way too. Like if you do the, like a fish, the fish gut, um, fish are osmoregulators. So it doesn't matter if it's a marine fish, freshwater fish, the internal salinity is the same. The internal environment of the gut is exactly the same. So you can treat them the same way. Um, you put it in their food, they'll um, digest more of their food and therefore produce less waste. And then they'll also have some uh, added uh, protection from disease. Oh, and then the other thing, because they can digest cellulose, this is kind of a nice one, actually. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, some of these bacteria have appeared in the past in uh, pond products, just sludge digesters. In that case, we're mostly talking about leaf litter and, and, and grass clippings and stuff that get in the pond. They don't break down well because cellulose doesn't. There are not a lot of bacteria that possess the enzymes to do that, right? Well, these guys do. So they, they bust the crap out of that stuff. And uh, say you have a planted tank, it's kind of the same thing. If you have a lot of uh, dead plant matter at the bottom in a place that's hard to get, like, uh, like a thick bunch of uh, anacharis or whatever, where it's, you can't just get in there and siphon it and just kind of builds up. Uh, these, will, these guys will just kind of break that down, whereas a lot of other bacteria cannot. Yellowing compounds as well. So uh, fresh and salt water tanks, but we see this in fresh water tanks because the plants uh, release a lot of uh, yellowing compounds that discolor, they tint the water. Uh, those polyphenols, these guys can break that down, whereas a lot of uh, uh, bacteria cannot. So they'll actually clarify your water a little bit. Mm -hmm. Orlando. Yeah, yeah. So Rhodocudomonas is in a family uh, that includes a lot of uh, rhizobial bacteria, or rhizobia being roots. And uh, some of those are obligate symbi symbionts with like legumes. Again, we were talking like alfalfa, and clover, and uh, all those cover crops that uh, can fertilize the soil. They live in crappy soil. And the reason for that is they, uh, they have these bacteria that can fix nitrogen. So it doesn't matter if there isn't enough if the soil is infertile, they just have their own source that makes it. Um, well, those are obligate, right? Some of those, uh, like rhizo the rhizobium, the ones that live in those uh, types of plants. Uh, these guys are generalists. So it doesn't matter. Again, like it could be like turf, cannabis, uh, or like uh, Anubius or something like that in an aquarium. It all works the same way because these guys can live by themselves out in the open. They actually live with uh, in association with like um, macro algaes, do the same thing. And additionally, they produce phytohormones, the most important of which is oxen, which uh, if you know a lot about plant physiology, oxen plays a whole, it's a, it's a hormone that basically directs its growth, but can also enhance its growth, especially roots. So if you're trying to root stuff, uh, this is amazing for that. Like, uh, it, I cannot believe at this point, maybe I should do something about that, make some real money, but. Uh, it would be like as, as a substitute to synthetic root hormones for people that are cloning um, different types of plants. Yeah, so it induces root formation. Yes? And you were talking about, you know, some people nitrate those things, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, my nitrate stuff. But you're saying that using this, you don't have to worry about your nitrate. 
I would want my nitrates to bottom out. Um, yeah. You know, so I've been doing this a while. I've seen a lot of things blamed on dinos. We were, yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's the going thing. It, it may be true too, but I remember we were raising the temperature. We were playing with the alkalinity. You know, we tried different additives and it's like, is that, I don't know. Like, because a, a coral reef is going to have, like, from what I've read, on average, like 0 .00, 0, is it like 0 .006 part, parts per million nitrate? Like nitrate is almost non-detectable. It, it, it's really not that important. And it certainly isn't important to corals because isn't that like, and that's the reason I'm sure you're using ammonia now, right? They don't. So um, nitrate doesn't really benefit a reef in any way that I can think of, uh, other than, you know, it, it, it produces algae. So when we go to places that have higher nitrates, like place like uh, more temperate uh, environments, um, like cold water, like if you go to the West Coast or something like that, where you have upwelling and then those nutrients are brought up to the surface and you have more nitrate, what you see are like kelp beds and stuff like that, because then you're promoting algae growth. Uh, the fact that, uh, and that's what Darwin observed, like we were talking about, he couldn't figure out why, how, how is all this stuff growing in where there's no nitrogen in the water, right? Um, because he would have expected to see a bunch of phytoplankton if it were so fertile, but it's because of these bacteria. So I would say go, you know, one could go one step further and instead of dosing the, the ammonia, you could dose the bacteria that regulate the ammonia. Now remember, there's a thing called, so they have a, there's a thing called, uh, sorry, I'll, uh, uh, if this gets too crazy, but there's a, these bacteria have a thing called ammonia shutoff, right? So if there is ammonia or nitrate in the water, uh, they're not going to fix nitrogen because it's energetically too expensive for them. The analogy I always make, so by the way, you're never going to completely bottom out because by the way, these guys are denitrifiers as well. So they could actually get rid of more nitrate than other bacteria would just through growth, right? Assimilation. Um, they denitrate, so they, denitrifying, they can actually also take up nitrate as a form to obtain energy. Uh, but it, so if they have nitrate in the water, there's this thing called ammonia shutoff where they'll, they'll stop fixing nitrogen and they'll just take it out of the water, ammonia or nitrate. The analogy is, uh, so if you have a hot pizza sitting on the table, you're not going to like just bust out all the ingredients from the cupboards and make one for, from scratch, right? It's too much time. It does, it's not worth the energy. That's basically what these bacteria do. But if the, if there is no pizza and they're hungry, uh, rather than sitting there and starving like most other bacteria, these guys can actually um, just make the pizza, so to speak. So, but they'll only do that if there's no other, there's no pizza available to them. Now that was a, I mangled that analogy, so I hope that made sense. But, uh, okay, yeah. Hmm. Not sure. I'll be honest, I don't know. And if we're talking about like macroalgae, like if you have a, a ulva in your tank or something like that, I mean, there's theoretically, I've never seen this, but theoretically it, it could even promote the growth of those because it's a nitrogen fixer, right? So if you're reducing your nitrogen, trying to get rid of the algae, it could actually, I mean, they're not going to produce a ton, so you're not going to get a huge boost to the algae because of it. But theoretically, it could slightly promote the algae growth. And that's a very specific circumstances that I'm only pulling out of my hat. I've never seen that occur. Um, on the other hand, they definitely do get rid of cyanobacteria. So, because they. I, I have, I'm fighting cyano quite a bit. Uh huh. And I've used it. I do if I can get away with it. Uh huh. And that would take care of that problem then if I just dose the trigger and use it. We've had a lot of reports of that. All the test tanks I've ran, and this came up after the fact. All the test tanks I've ran these bacteria in it only occurred to me like a year later i'm like i've never seen cyan on your you know so it's one of those um it makes sense theoretically because they they compete very directly right so they both are competing for like access to light and uh they're both heterotrophs so they want they compete for or dissolved organic matter and they're competing for space because they grow at least the cyanobacteria we don't want in our tanks right the stuff that grows on things so they're competing for uh, for real estate, um, 
and uh, these bacteria obviously can, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll release antibiotics like streptomycin, canamycin, things that are uh, inhibitive to a lot of uh, cyanobacteria. So absolutely. Actually, on our display tank, I don't know if you guys have noticed um, here in the shop at Inside Reef, the, it was littered with, it's not, it's not great yet, but we've actually um, been dosing it in this tank and the cyano is actually going away. Um, and someone had recommended to actually inject it into the sand um, to get it kicking in there. And we've noticed probably a 50% drop off in the last two weeks. It's not going to work as fast as chemically, but all of our uh, sponges have popped up everywhere. Uh, that's they're not dying. Um, and it's it's just a chemical you're not adding. Yeah, to the and the problem I have is it just keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. with right. It looks good for yep. a month and then it just comes back. Well, you're yeah. not removing the yeah. the cause of it, right? right. <laughs> you're just so killing the cyanide. Yeah. Else, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about combining, combining the PNS with the uh, uh, oh the flocculant uh, carbo uh, carbon and calcium as a flocculant? Yeah. So some of the big proponents of that out there have talked about adding. Our bacteria to that, I haven't seen them do that yet, so I don't know. The, the weird thing about that, though, I think is like with the, um, the coral snow thing, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the point of the coral snow is that it actually, so when it's uh, you just it's pure calcium carbonate, right? And then it's more reactive and can bind to things. I think it, it's almost like uh, I, would love to, uh, I would love to promote our product for more and more stuff, but I don't know that it really has a lot of uh, use there or any bacteria because you don't really want to be, it's almost like clogging up your carbon with something before you put it in, right? Like you want that stuff to be reactive. As I understand the coral snow method, well, I would just put in the calcium carbonate. Yeah, with the coral snow method through like zeobit systems, which is bacteria driven, uh -huh. a lot of times they recommend, especially like with cyano, taking the cyano clean, which is some type of bacteria or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, and their bacteria is, and putting it with your uh, flocculant, with your carbocalcium, um, carb the coral snow, uh -huh. and let it sit in there for five, ten minutes to bind to that, so that can to help disperse it through the tank. Yeah, if you're using it as like a delivery mechanism, that would be one thing. So I could see if the, the goal is to uh, turn, it in, turn it into a food. But you got to pick and choose. I think it's like, do you want it? Do you want to use the coral snow to? Um, uh, I think it's in its raw form. It's supposed to bind to phosphate. Is no. that no? no okay. It clears out, makes your water clear, helps pull out. Uh, it's more like organic bit. matter. Yeah, more organic okay. matter. It binds yeah. to that, which then can then be taken out via your stalks and your protein skimmer. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, and still, I would say like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bind it to the. If that's what you want to do, I wouldn't bind it to the bacteria because then the the bacteria are taking up right. So it's like I'd pick and choose. I'd either just not put bacteria in it, or if you wanted to use it as a way to deliver, uh, the bacteria to, on a particle or something, then I would say yeah, that that may have some kind of use. It's something that you know, uh, uh, uh it may even be like a natural naturally occurring phenomena, actually, because uh, we have precipitation of calcium carbonate in the wild. And I suppose if you have that stuff floating around, bacteria you know, could uh, colonize it and, and uh, get eaten that way if a coral catches it. So I would say, yeah, uh, I would say maybe. It depends on what you want to do, what your intended purpose of adding the coral snow is. I got one for you. Uh, <laughs> I know that it's live bacteria. What is the shelf life? on uh this product because i ordered a lot mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll blow through it but yeah i hope so <laughs> um so eight months is our uh nominal non-refrigerated yeah so if it, it we, we've tested this strain actually it survives freezing very well actually yeah you thaw it out and it's almost like nothing happened to it I'll, I'll alternately, it can survive very high temperatures. Like, kind of likes high temperatures. So, we've had it uh, exposed to like 130 degrees for a couple days, and it's completely viable. In other words, we use it to grow more cultures. That's the only way you'd know for sure, right? And and those new cultures grew just as well. 
so yeah, I can freeze solid. Uh, so room temperature is totally fine. Uh, eight months is kind of just being on the safe side where we want people to use it while it's fresh, especially like after you open it, then anything could happen. If somebody's got their dirty fingers in the lid and you introduce a contaminant or something like that. But uh, unopened, especially, like I, I don't even really know what the, because they just cannibalize. They're so adaptable, right? All those things we were saying before where they can, they can uh, use CO2 as a carbon source even. Um, they fix their own nitrogen. Uh, they get uh, like any kind of, like almost any carbon source. So like in the bottle, they'll just keep cannibalizing themselves and live almost indefinitely. It's it's pretty crazy. So uh, I don't have a local guy, uh, Larry Lazinski. Some of you guys may know him. He uh, he ordered a bottle for me like long ago, and uh, it fell behind his uh, shelf or something like that. And he's like, "Is this still good?" Because it had been like it, it was like a year old. So it was like grossly, um, in fact, in our, our expiration date at that time was only six months out instead of eight because I was being really conservative at first. And I'm like, no, man, it's like pretty expired. But if you send me that bottle so I can test it, I'll send you two fresh ones. And that's what we did. I used that to uh, grow a new culture. And again, like nothing happened. It, and that was in the dark. If these sit out in the light, even just ambient light, like you've got these here, there, here, a little bit of light. Now they have an input of energy from light. So that just keeps them going a little bit more. So honestly, I, I don't want to, I don't want to encourage people to use old or outdated bottles, but I can assure you, uh, it, it'll, it sits on the shelf at room temperature for months and months and months, at least eight months. And, uh, if something goes wrong and we've never seen this, I mean, so thousands and thousands of bottles, I've never seen one go, go bad per se, where it completely spoiled. Uh, but you would know because uh, the uh, carotenoids are so such a conspicuous indi indicator of its presence, right? If you don't see that bright red in the bottle, then you know that it went bad. And something else had likely something else in there had uh, spoiled it and consumed all the. In all the years that we've been exclusive distributor, we've never had one bottle spoil, not one, even after the expiration date. Well, that's good. I didn't want to be the first. <laughs> so at this concentration, you know, the live bacteria, especially something that so aggressively fights off other stuff. Again, it has all the, it produces all these uh, antibiotics of its own. That's how it fights Vibrio and so forth. Uh, it just kind of edges out. For, I mean, for one thing, it, obviously they've consumed all of the, the nutrients, the growth nutrients before we bottle it. Uh, so there's not much for other bacteria to grow on, but then also, uh, uh, you know, these bacteria so aggressively fight other bacteria um, that uh, it, it's it's unlikely that you're bought. No, but they do smell bad. So don't go by smell as an indicator. It's a it's a it's a fermentated product, right? It's it's an anaerobic. You open it up and it'll smell pretty bad. But that that odor goes away. It just dissipates and you get used to it. Yes. How much would you say is the minimum dosage that's useful? Because I've got about a thousand gallons. Totally. Uh, so, you know, even useful is so subjective. I'm like, what would you want to see? Would you want to see a uh, measurable um, impact on fish health? Would you want to see your phosphates go down by X number of parts per million, or hopefully tenths of parts per million, um, but, or something like that? So you'd kind of have to have a specific goal in mind because uh, for every, no every number of cells you add, they're going to have a certain impact. And that, and that impact is determined by your own unique aquarium system. So that's the trouble with any live method, right? If it's a trouble, is that you can't accurately predict what's like uh, lanthanum chloride. We know, you know, so much per gallon, you're going to remove your phosphate by X. That, you know, but with a live product and our aquarium systems are unique ecosystems, it's really hard to say. So um, to be honest, I, I can't really answer that question. I am answer, I, I'd answer the question, but not with an answer, if that makes sense. <laughs> Basically, it's not possible to predict exactly how, unless you knew exactly what you're going for and what the existing conditions were. So for example, like if you were feeding the bacteria, it would depend on the temperature. So they, they are more productive at a higher temperature. Um, so it's like, do you carbon dose? Do you have a, a deep sand bed somewhere? Things like that would promote their growth. 
So what you do is you, you know, you set up, we have an arbitrary dose of one point, somewhat arbitrary, of 1.25 mil per gallon. And uh, you start from there, and then you either increase or lower the dosage based on um, your goals and, uh, your, your, uh, and, and, and the results that you're shooting for. But, but as we mentioned before, it's impossible to overdose. And actually, the more you add, because it's a live food that actually consumes wastes, uh, you're unlikely to pollute your water. You'll actually just increase. It, it, it's an increasing gain, right? So. Now, because it's a food, right? So that was a. The basis of this presentation was uh, we, we promote this mainly as a food. So we, we expect that uh, most of it will get consumed by the corals, your clams, your copepods, even things you can't see like all of your uh, protozoa. Um, so uh, that's something you'd want to add it regular, regularly. And the reason is that we don't, we generally don't have the, 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 the levels of the, the, the density of bacteria in our tanks that we would want because of all the skimming and UV and just, just the grazing of the corals, like a, a densely stocked coral tank. All those coral polyps are exposed and, and all their mucus is exposed and that's how they're catching the bacteria. And, and the bacteria constantly are floating over that and getting consumed. And even if you have high nutrients, they're getting consumed at a higher rate than, you know, so they're like, uh, uh, Maybe we've seen some studies where people were running skimmers and their tanks were one tenth of the density in terms of bacteria than you would find in the wild. Like only one tenth. And worse, it wasn't necessarily the bacteria that you would want to have in there as coral food. They may not necessarily be desirable species. So here you have a, a, a dense culture that you could pour in as a live food. And it is a known, not only a coral food, but in the wild, this exact same species, but a, a known coral uh, probiotic. So it would be something you would dose regularly, ideally. I do have a very pertinent question here, I hope. Um, yep. is, is it possible then, you know, you got all the different types of coral food out there, I mean, is this the end all be all? Can you just not mm -hmm. dose reefroids and amino acids and polyp extenders and stuff like that? Is is this mm -hmm. basically a replacement for that? I would sure say so, given that it's a natural live food. Like you don't get better than this. There's no better food than this. The only way people will think differently is if they look at the perceived cost compared to uh, reef. I don't I don't want to keep picking on reefroids, but uh, or I'm, they're going to come after me, but uh, any kind of prepared food like that, even even a natural food that's dead and frozen or something like that, say an algae paste or whatever, um, you're just not going to get the benefit, right? Nutritionally, and also the fact that it's live, it's it's consuming waste products. Uh, so, but from the cost benefit, it's like okay, well, uh, I, I spend this much. It's hard to like. How do you compare like a bottle of refroids? They just say it, this treats this much or feeds this much. This treats or feeds this much. And it's not, it's like apples and oranges because what are the other hidden costs associated with feeding? Reduced water quality, right? And then it's like, well, are you adding other probiotics now uh, to counter the, 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 you know, the, 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 the bad bacteria now that are growing as a result of all the waste products in the tank? So you got, you know, you've got like uh, water, you've got uh, the RO unit to purify that water, if it, or you buy the water from a store, uh, you're, or you're using chemical filtrants to get rid of all the, you know, all the excess phosphate or nitrate that may build up when you're using dead foods. Uh, the organic matter, the discoloration of the water, you're using tons and tons of carbon. Um, so uh, from a cost-benefit analysis, you kind of have to look at this in the same way that uh, commercial fish farms have been looking at this for half a century. And, and this is mainly in Asia. They're not known for just throwing money all over the place, right? They're, they're insanely cheap and everything is about the bottom line. The reason they, and not to pick on anybody, but, but that's the way they operate. And, 
they only use this because they know that it affects their bottom line from a cost benefit perspective, right? So water is increasingly getting expensive. And it's like if you have to keep replacing water or use all these chemical filtrants to remove pollutants, well, it seems like an attractive alternative is to use a food that actually cleans the water instead of polluting it. Yes. I'll ask a fish question. I've got a 310 gallon salver. Just a skimmer, no UV, nothing. Mm -hmm. My sand looks like that high, low, bare bottom, and it also looks pink and red on the side. <laughs> Would um, that tank benefit? Uh, cyanobacteria? I presume. I'm assuming it looks the same as that. Um, yeah, so very likely. Yeah, well, that that would be okay. These are two reasons you could use it in a fish tank. Um, you know, fish tanks tend to be, they tend to get, uh, the water quality tends to deteriorate pretty quickly because we tend to feed those tanks pretty heavily. And there's nothing to consume those wastes. We don't have the cleanup crews and the, other bacteria and stuff that, and the corals even taking up nutrients and so forth. So you end up with a lot of algae and cyanobacteria. Um, having a bacteria in there that actually cleans that stuff up would uh, reduce the need for water. I hate to say eliminate water changes. That's the old hated claim in our industry uh, for good reason, but it does, uh, it would reduce the, come on in. <laughs> Welcome. So it, it would reduce the need for water changes, most likely, because of the, all those added benefits, removing organic matter, uh, removing nutrients. So then you think of the other benefits, too, to your fish. Just like in fish hatcheries, uh, you put this in your food, it's going to uh, increase the feed conversion of your fish. So when they eat food, they'll digest more of it. And they'll have the uh, added, you know, the B vitamins and other things, the carotenoids, color enhancers that come with these bacteria, right? Um, and the, even more than that, uh, protection from various types of diseases. So that, that's pretty extensive, actually. Uh, they, they've studied that more and more in the last 10 years, but, and, and more so with like larval fish and so forth. But uh, they, these bacteria actually eliminate a lot of pathogens. We've focused on Vibrio in the past, but there are definitely other fish diseases. So it's, again, it's kind of a holistic approach, even in like a fowler type system. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh-huh. Can all three things be grown at the same time in the same container? Indefinitely? No. Probably not. No, not indefinitely, yeah. but like the grow kits that you have? Yes. Can you do all three in one of those at one time? We do. Yeah. And the reason is that it's exponential growth. So uh, you're putting out, um, you're putting three guys out on at the racetrack at the same time. And uh, one may run faster than the other, but they're all getting somewhere. Now, if they had, to, it's one lap, right? One batch. Now, if you keep trying to grow that over and over again, yeah, pretty soon, like, they're just going to start lapping each other and one will disappear. It's like with algae, right? You start out with, like, a whole bunch of species and you end up with nanochloropsis, which dominates. I don't know which one would dominate. It would probably depend on how it was grown, even, because they're so similar. It'd be like, one person's lighting might dominate, help promote one over the other in one situation, or one, pre one person grows at a slightly cooler temperature than in another. But, uh, when, but in the kit, uh, they're, they're all starting out on a clean slate. So they're all, they're all growing until they hit their carrying capacity and all the nutrients are gone. So continuous culture, the answer would be no. In the kits, definitely yes. We do. We used to offer, yes, we used to offer them separately. Yeah, and then some, I think a lot of people are just less interested in some of the less known species like Rotobacter. And as I start, I mean, I'm still learning a lot about this. Every day I research it and find, it, there's just so much stuff coming out. And Rotobacter increasingly is, is attractive for uh, um, the controlling disease, for example, uh, through different means too. It attacks Vibrio and I'm like, you know, and it's a whole different nutritional content. So I'm like, that's where we're going to go with this is just try to like uh, put them all together. And like I said, uh, ProBio actually at some point here in the future will contain all three as well. Mm -hmm. So in theory, would you say, so if you have corals in your tank that aren't thriving as strong as other corals are, would you say this product would kind of bring them up to par so they're thriving just as strongly as the other corals are? 
potentially, but it depends on why they're not thriving, of course. So uh, there's nothing these bacteria could do for them if they're not getting enough light, for example. So they got an acro in what should be an LPS tank, and it's just not, right? But, but uh, uh huh. I have a Rasta and I have a Spider Man both on a rock. They both get the same amount of light. My Rastas are completely taking over the rock, and my Spider Man is exactly the same as when we bought them at uh -huh. the same time. Uh huh. And that's why I'm asking is they're both getting the same light, they're both getting the same food, the parameters are the same, but one's accelerating versus the other. Yeah, I would say potentially, but you don't really know because. Uh... While all corals will benefit from these bacteria in their diet, they may benefit disproportionately. And it won't necessarily, they're not going to side with the underdog, right? They'll, they'll raise up all the ships, but the, the one that's already uh, doing better might just be doing that much better. So it's hard to say. Uh, if one's really struggling, though, uh, increasing its diet in terms of not just quantity of food, but especially uh, improving the, quanti the quality of its food, definitely may give it an edge and allow it to compete if it's getting overgrown by a neighbor. Um, but that's another one that's pretty difficult to say because the living systems are so hard to predict. There's so many other factors at play. Hey, Kim, we've got a, uh, a question from a live audience. Awesome. How often would you want to go to a model of Eastern and Ashton Galaxy? Uh, that would be a little more than two doses per se if they used our recommended um, maximum dose. So one bottle treats 400 gallons. Um, so, but uh, I mean, it depends on your uh, intended. It depends on your intent, right? So if you're trying to get these to grow in your tank permanently, um, generally what I recommend is just douse it then. Because the you can't overdose it, as, as I keep saying. But the other thing is, uh, if you inundate a biomedium or something like that, with these guys, they're going to have a better chance of invading it. Because uh, a lot of the times, the they're, they're, they're going to have to edge out existing bacteria. Um, and the best way to do that is just to throw huge numbers at them. Um, part of the reason that, for example, there's this thing called quorum sensing, where they they uh, talk to each other through chemical exchange. And uh, when they're kind of loners and they're out there floating around and they're, they're kind of, their own kind isn't abundant, then they don't waste energy making antibiotics because why? It's just going to get diluted and it's just a waste of energy for them. However, um, if they're all in formation and there's a lot of them and they're ready to go uh, and they start talking to each other and they're like, hey, man, there's a lot of us here. It's worthwhile to create antibiotics. Then all of a sudden they start doing that. And they can produce enough to make enough of a concentration that would actually create what's called a zone of inhibition around the little spot they're growing or whatever. So point is, if you're going to, uh, if you're really trying to get the stuff to grow in your tank, just put a whole bunch in at once. Like little drops spread out over a week isn't going to really do anything because all the other existing bacteria in the tank may com outcompete them. Now, the opposite is true. If you use this the way we really promote it and, and, and uh, suggest using it is as a food, right? That's where you'd want to put in a little bit at a time. So uh, I would just say, like, if you have a tank that big, and we recommend using this, uh, uh, you know, the maximum dose, up to the maximum dose every day, uh, potentially. Uh, you could put that in the food again. And um, in that case, it would be, like, just a couple uses for a big tank like that. But... Uh, you could spread it out, and there are diminishing returns, but you still have a benefit. It's not like if you don't do the full dose, you get no benefits, right? So in that case, like I would rec if they're really concerned about the cost, it was like we were talking earlier about cost benefit overall. Looking at uh, if you're if you're feeding with something else that pollutes the water, then there are hidden costs to using a different food, right? Um, but if you're using a food that cleans the water, then it doesn't seem as expensive and you can maybe put it in the food more often and then you get all those probiotic benefits, not just to your corals, but to your fish. So uh, you could use less in that case, especially if you're adding it to food. It, it just depends on how you're preparing the food and everything. We put in it just enough to soak it, right? So like if you have all your stuff chopped up and it depends on if it's powders or chopped up krill, stuff like that, but just enough to like kind of submerge it and really soak it well. 
Um, and that, that dosage may change based on your feeding habits. But again, I, I would recommend using the maximum dose daily. That seems expensive, but when you look at the whole picture, that changes everything, right? Um, but uh, yeah, depends if you're trying to like inoculate the tank, go big. If you're trying to feed, then you know, just to, if you can do the recommended daily dose and, and put that in the food, more of a continuous thing. Could I put that product into a already existing phytoplankton, or would it eliminate it completely? Would it kill your phytoplankton? Yes, because you said it was kind of like the the meat and the greens together. Yeah. So what I meant by that is like when you're feeding the two together, they nutritionally balance each other. Uh, just a review of that point is uh, that the the algae are rich in like fatty acids mainly, and these guys are rich in proteins and B vitamins. So they complement each other. They're better together than they are alone. Uh, they could live together. The only thing is it, it would mess up your, uh, your process for growing algae because these guys would consume most of the same um, uh, nutrients that you're using to grow your phyto. Now what you could do is grow out your phyto and then add these so that you actually have the phyto grown out. And there may be some benefits actually because these guys consume some of the waste products that the, the algae make, especially when they're in a bottle, that gnarly smell, which uh, often is probably is prob like DMSP, a, a sulfur compound that, that smells like kind of the ocean. It's some phytoplankton products, algae release this stuff and they're stressed. Uh, and it may reduce that in the bottle, right? Or other things that are stinky or organic wastes. That's just something we haven't really done yet. We actually have a, an algae producer right now that is looking into that combining is a finished product. I don't know if that's what you meant, but I, I wouldn't necessarily grow them together, but you could add it after the fact. Yeah. Saving space is what I was looking for. Okay. From that answer, I would probably just buy two of the extras and then go some together. Yeah. 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 In fact, yeah, exactly too. Like if you were going to do the grow kit, is that what you're looking at? Yeah. The way we grow these, you mean like the, well, we have a home grow kit. If you're doing phyto, you might be interested in the kit. Where, uh, yeah. What I would be looking into. Uh, yeah. And then dose them just like you said, one at a time into the tank, and use that as the my experiment. Yeah, you can feed them at the same time. That's what I'd recommend, because then they're more nutritionally balanced. If we uh, do carry here at Inside Reef, if anyone wants to grab one. <laughs> I'll be here. Oh, kids. Yeah. You make this stuff in bigger quantities. You have gallon sizes or things like that. We're looking into that actually. So after this is, so we're going to revamp. You know, ProBio will be all three species, but I mean, it's going to be it won't have that Etsy look and label anymore. <laughs> it'll be a little bit more presentable and all that, but uh, it'll have a new a new bottle and everything. And at that time, um, we're thinking of maybe. After we kind of do all, redo all the graphic design, have the labels made for like bottles that we could, you know, we could do like a gallon, a one gallon jug. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you know the either the grow kit. Yeah. Really well. Yeah. So that's where the, you know the grow kit would be for people with larger volumes because those treat eight thousand gallons, but some people aren't interested in growing stuff. They want it now and they don't want to take up space and. And do all that. So, um, I, yeah, I do think like the one gallon size has a place because so there's that's the thing too is that there's an increasing benefit with tank size, and I see the opposite pushback. Like people that have larger sizes and have to dose a lot, they're like, "Oh, this is getting really expensive." But I'm like, "But yeah, you're getting the biggest benefit from water changes because this is reducing your need for water change." So I get this. I get it's a weird uh, like inverse um, reaction in terms of uh, people looking at the cost. But yeah, so that's what the, that's what the kits were made for, really, is for people that wanted to uh, treat, or, or with farms, treat larger volumes of water. But in that case, you make it yourself. And uh, it's not just the time, but it's the shipping volume then, right? Like you get this little packet that'll make like two and a half gallons. So something that, you know, is almost is like featherweight now can grow like, you know, uh, 20 pounds, what well, would be like 20 pounds to ship. So, 
it's just kind of uh, more feasible economically for us and the consumer. Uh, but yeah, again, it's like not everyone wants to not everyone wants to grow their own stuff. So we were always looking into larger volumes and had explored other options, and we we did settle on a gallon. So it's good to hear that, and that's what I'm saying. Like before, where it's, the feedback's amazing because it it tells me what people actually want and need. Yes. So this is going to sound like a weird question, and hopefully I can ask it right. Lovely. I love weird questions, dude. <laughs> so if I'm growing uh, macroalgae, specifically chato, and chato takes all the nutrients out of water, it takes all the different contaminants. Uh huh. With using this product, how much would the chato actually take out of the water? Like how much would it? Because I know it absorbs all the different like, phosphates. Oh yeah, and then would it die too? That's what yeah, like would it, it, so yeah. It, would it kill? Yeah. Kill the chato, or would the chato kill? The bacteria that's in the bottles. It's hard to kill the bacteria because they're so adaptable. And again, like say, 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 say your macro algae, whatever kind it is, bottomed out your your ammonia or your nit uh, nitrate. They're nitrogen fixers, so they don't care. They just take nitrogen gas and make ammonia out of it, and they can keep growing, right? So, like, you can say, oh, they're nitrogen fixers, so they add nitrogen. You can, so you can say they're denitrifiers, so they remove nitrogen by right? removing nitrate. But what they really do, yeah. yeah. I know you put the phosphorus inside the tank, and I know specific chato actually phosphorus. I'm so by oh, definitely. Like, basically, put my fingers in. But I, I've never seen like I've seen a negative negative side effect from like many bacteria put in two seven twenty nine. Yeah, actually, I think these are a really good bacteria for refugium for a number of reasons. Um, one is that plants love them, right? Love these bacteria. They make phytohormones. They fix nitrogen. So if the nitrogen does bot, so what I was going to say before is, yes, they, re they add nitrogen when it's low. They remove it when it's in abundance, at least nitrate, because they're denitrifiers. So what they, they don't really add or remove, they regulate. So they keep it at a very, nitrate at a very low level, right? So it, you're actually maintaining, uh, you're, you're keeping some there, but you're maintaining it at a very low level, which is closer to uh, a normal reef environment. Uh, so then would you say from what he was saying, like, would you recommend on a full dose, 75% of it in the main display, and then 25% of it actually in the chato, so then that way the full effect, the chato's actually really starting to use it as a uh, accelerant. Yeah, and, and I think like a lot of refugiums, that's a dumping ground for detritus. Right, um, depends on how it's set up, but oftentimes it's slower flow, and you got all this uh, stuff in the water that slows the water flow down and traps becomes like a a, a sediment sink. Um, that's why it's like pour all your probio in there uh, because that's gonna gr it's gonna thrive in there. You have all that organic matter. It'll 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 literally just as instead of having to dose all these weird carbons like you know drink the vodka you got and you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just throw this stuff in your tank, it'll eat your detritus, right? So you put it in your refugium, it's got that organic matter, uh, it has the light, right? Uh, everything it needs to really grow. You may even have a substrate in there where it has a really good anaerobic zone to, to keep reproducing in. I turned my sump, I had a, a portion where it used to actually have the heating tube in it, and I was able to move it. So right when the water actually comes out of our exterior and it starts coming into the sump, I have a chamber specifically for the for as a refugium. So uh -huh. way it still has water and it still flows through the tank. So it still has water that passes through it. Not a okay. lot, but it's a decent amount. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean in that case, I mean, because it's getting a lot of exchange with the main tank anyway, I would just like uh, I would just pour the stuff straight in the refugium. For one, that's where it's gonna do the most good. Like that's where most of your detritus is also. Um, macro algae produce a ton of yellowing compounds, right? Those polyphenols that turn our water yellow. These guys eat that. So if they're in your refugium in good concentration, they'll actually help clarify your water and get rid of some of those uh, algal exudates, which, by the way, uh, sometimes can irritate corals. So if you have this growing, you know, in a in concentration in the area where, you know, most of your problems are, it's a problem to your corals, but it's like like a paradise for these guys. So you may be able to actually cultivate them in your tank. This, you know, they'll last longer or grow well, maybe even permanently in an environment like that. And in so doing, actually promote the growth of your, your macro algae too.
All right, guys. I oh, well, we got one more. Go ahead. Bottles versus the Like, what what volume of product would I get from the kit? How much of the kit would I get? So I can understand if I just want to buy a boatload of bottles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, aside from cost, the bottle's obviously convenient because they're already made. You don't have to worry about failing. If you do, by the way, they are 100% guaranteed. Fail rate's super low. Um, if they fail, I replace them. I've literally done that like four times ever. So it's uh, it, it, that's the success rate is really high. But you do have the guarantee that you have like the stuff. It's their high density. It's ready for you when you need it. That's you're paying for the convenience too. But uh, one of those treats 400 gallons, as opposed to the kit which treats 8,000 gallons. Yeah, so quite a bit. You have the added, uh, you know, you got to factor in the time to grow it. it takes about a month typically, uh, and then you need to keep it warm too. So a heat pad generally. Most of us have to have some external source of heat. To get it up to like that 82 degrees. Uh, with the kit, do you have to grow out the entirety of the uh, packet that you sent in one go? Ah, uh, good point. Yeah, um, I would because the kit actually comes with the culture vessel. It's a uh, like a collapsible polyethylene clear. Yeah, it comes with a spigot. Yeah. So uh, you just turn the speed, you know, you have this like two and a half gallons of it, which is actually quite a bit. You're only dosing a little at a time, but uh, it comes with a spigot. So you just open that and take a little bit at a time. So it's easy to dispense precisely. And it also helps uh, keep it from getting um, contaminated. Yeah, but 8,000 gallons, it'll last that. So the, in the shelf life on that one, it's like it starts from the time you make it, right? So. Uh, Obviously, it's a new culture that you made, so the clock only starts ticking after you actually sit down and make the 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 product. Mm -hmm. The process like this company goes into culture after I get it semi up in first. Um, it might grow, but you know you'd want to like a rich medium to get like a, a really good density like that. And that's the product of like 80 different recipes we tried before we settled on a good growth medium. They have their own growth medium as is. And then we had to fine tune that because like the recipes given online are for like labs and so forth, where they don't really give a crap if you have like, if the end product will uh, raise your phosphates by like two parts per million or something, right? Uh, or it smells horrifically worse than that. Uh, so... What's that? Hard to imagine. Oh, it. Yeah, uh, yeah try use. Uh, they all recommend yeast extract, and that stuff literally smells like roadkill. So, um, yeah. So it took a lot of work to get something that was more useful for an aquarium, where it didn't raise your nutrients. Like the the bacteria, perfectly consumed all the available nutrients and uh, had all the properties we wanted. Like you can control, for example, um, the 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 nutritional quality, how much uh, carotenoid. They produce just based on their diet um, and growth conditions, which we also manipulate with regards to light cycle, things like that. So um, ProBio definitely is going to be like the ideal product. If you buy it in the bottle, it's made to be perfect for an aquarium. Uh, there's obviously going to be a little more variation if you do the kit because there are different sources of light and things like that. Sounds like we got all the questions answered. Awesome. Um, Thank you to Orlando and Ken for making this happen. Um, you know, give them a hand to us. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate you guys for coming in and doing this uh, for us. I'm glad we had a good turnout. Thank you all for coming, uh, by the way. Um, and uh, I'm fat and hungry, so we got pizza and drinks back there. Let's rock and roll, guys. Uh